All right, good morning, everyone. If you guys open your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And um, we're in the section of 1 Thessalonians where he's giving some instructions and practical grace life living of what, what our lives should look like as believers that are filled with the Spirit. And um, if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and start in verse 15 with me, it says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. And so last time we kind of finished up on the issue and we started talking about, we didn't get quite through it all the way of, of uh, verse 18 of where he says, in everything give thanks. And we pointed out last time that the, the important word that it starts off with is what? In everything, it doesn't say for everything. And, and we talked about how that our circumstances does not determine whether or not we can give thanks. The same thing goes for, if you look at verse 16, he says to do what? Rejoice evermore. It's not based on circumstances, right? Pray without ceasing. How often should we do that? Not based on our circumstances, but what we pray for might change. However, we should always be doing what? Praying. And then he says, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And, and we talked about how our understanding who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ and how we're complete in Him and, and accepted in the Beloved and how that, that gives us the ability to understand. When we understand more about who we are in Christ, it gives us the ability, no matter the circumstances, whether they're good or whether they're bad, we have the ability in any circumstance to give thanks. And we have the ability to give thanks because of who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so a few things to give thanks for, and I, I figure we'll go through this before we start about talking about today, we're going to be talking about quench not the spirit, um, because I think these verses, all these verses tie in one to, to the other. Um, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He's talking about the, our, our corruptible putting on incorruption, mortal putting on immortality. And, and you get to verse 54, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 54. It says, So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up, where? In victory. He says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. And then verse 57, it says, But thanks be to who? God. Which giveth us the victory through who, though? Our Lord Jesus Christ. So do we, as the members of the body of Christ, already have the victory? Yes, because we have the promise of hope that one day this corruptible is going to do what? Put on incorruption. This mortal is going to put on immortality. God is going to equip us with the body that's going to display his glory for eternity. And so he tells us that victory, that we already have that, that death, guess what? Death doesn't have control over us because it's already been taken care of. And that's what the chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 deals with, the issue of the resurrection, the issue of life. And that's what we have. So we have victory. So because we have the victory, we have the ability that in everything we can give thanks. See that? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And, and start in verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And look at verse 12. He says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest where? In my spirit. So the circumstances in his life, guess what? He wasn't very rested. And he says, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of, the, leave of them, 
I went from thence into Macedonia. And then look at the attitude here of what Paul says. He says in verse 14, Now what? Thanks beware unto God, which always causes us to triumph where? In Christ. See, the issue is always going to come back. Our thanksgiving is going to come from something that we have where? In Christ. And he says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse 3 and 4. He says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named amongst you as become a saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather, look at the replacement of that is what? Giving of thanks. So foolishness is replaced with what? According to that verse, we can replace it with giving of thanks. See that? Does that make sense? And so in everything, go back to 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, in everything we can see, and there's so many good verses on the issue of the giving of thanks and gave thanks, and you can go and look at that. In everything we can give thanks, in everything we should give thanks. And by the way, the end of that verse says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus, what? Concerning you. The will of God is, is that we, in everything we do what? Give thanks. We don't have to ask ourselves, when we go to pick up the Bible, people always say that the will of God is so mysterious. Oh, I don't know what the will of God is in my life. If we just pick up our Bibles, take some time to read it and study it, we can find out real quick what the will of God is in each and every one of our lives. The will of God is not a mystery. It's right here written in His Word. And all we have to do is pick it up, study it, and read it. And we understand that His will is what? All men be saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. Starting, part, coming to the knowledge of the truth gives us the ability in everything to give thanks. See that? Next verse. Another short verse. Right? Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. Short verses. Another one we have here. Verse 19. Quench not the what? The spirit. Now that word quench, it's an interesting word. And, and when you think of quench, you think of maybe you're thirsty. It mean, but the word, the definition of the word is to extinguish, to put out, to be still, to be quiet, and to repress, as to quench a passion or emotion, to stifle. And then what's interesting about using the 1828 dictionary is, is it gives reference to this verse as to quench the spirit. And so the word quench is used 12 times in our Bible in 12 verses. And this reference here is the only one dealing with specifically the issue of the Spirit of God. The rest of the ones deals with a lot of different issues in the Old Testament. But this one here specifically is dealing with quench not the Spirit. There's another time Paul uses that word. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And I think all this ties together pretty well here. In Ephesians chapter 6... We understand that the issue of what Paul is covering in Ephesians chapter 6 is the issue of how God is equipping believers today. And, and you look at verse 10. Start in verse 10. Let's get a little context here. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong, where? In the Lord and in the power of whose might? His might. So the issue of what he's going to talk about in the rest of this section here is, is that where do we draw our strength from? In the Lord. Right? Then he says in verse 11, Put on the whole armor of God, that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that he may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand... Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of what? Peace. Now what's in common 
what's in common to all of those things is, is all of those things there described is who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Is the Lord Jesus Christ truth? He is. Is the Lord Jesus Christ righteousness? Is the Lord Jesus Christ peace? So then the next, the issue of the armor of God is, is understanding who the Lord Jesus Christ is because He is going to be the one that equips us. The issue is not focusing and honing in on exactly, oh, this armor fits here, this armor fits there. The issue is putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the issue of what he's talking about here is. And then he says in verse 16, above all, taking the shield of what? Who is the one that was always faithful? The Lord Jesus Christ. Now that term shield, that's an interesting term, by the way, in the Bible. And by the way, the term shield, we don't have time to go through all the mentions, but when it refers to shield in the book of Psalms, guess who it talks about? It talks about the Lord. Let's look at a few verses, though, about that. Go to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. And look at verse 1. Genesis 15, verse 1. It says, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am what? Thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So who is the shield? The Lord is. Go to the book of Psalms. Go to the book of Psalms, chapter 3. Psalms, chapter 3. And look at verse 1. Psalms, chapter 3. And look at verse 1. He says, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him where? In God, Selah. What is happening, by the way, today? People say that if we trust in God, there's no what? There's no help. There's no hope. There is no God. It hasn't changed, by the way. All the way back in David's time, this is the way he was describing things. Guess what's taking place today as well? The same thing. Look at the next verse, though, in verse 3. He says, But thou, O Lord, art a what? Shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. You see what the Lord does for him? Now you have to back up and say, Does the Lord do that for us today as the members of the body of Christ? I'd have to say so. How he does it today, though, is going to be through his word and learning about who he is. And so he says, Thou art a shield for me. Go to the next passage here in the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 28. Psalms chapter 28. And look at verse 6 and 7. He says, Blessed be the Lord... Because he hath heard the voice of my what? Supplications. What does Paul tell us that we should do? Think about that. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and what? Supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Does God hear our voice? Yeah. Then he says, The Lord is my strength and my what? Shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am what? Helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I do what? Praise him. I want you to keep that verse in mind, because later on we're going to look at how God works through the Spirit today, and how he does that is, is he works through his word, and how he works through his word is, is by us trusting and believing his word to be true, and when we do that, it produces a song within our soul. What took place right here? The same exact thing. He trusts in the Lord, his heart trusts in him, he rejoices in him, and then in song will he do what? 
Praise Him. The Word of God causes that in His soul, in His heart. The same thing for us today. We're going to see that connection shortly. So the issue is, what the issue is going to be about, the issue is going to be about who Christ is. Go with me to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. We have to understand who Christ is, and the issue is going to be then also that we are going to have to know who he is, and then we are going to need to rely and trust in his faithfulness, because our faith isn't good enough. We take our faith and we have to put it somewhere where it's going to remain sound. And that's going to be in the faithfulness of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And so Galatians chapter 2 has two really good verses about that. And for me, a big, a big thing to think about too is, is that you have to have a Bible that you can trust, right? If I don't have a Bible that I can trust and that it can just change words to fit my opinion... Because, oh, today I feel like the Word of God should say this. And then I'm going to use a different Bible version to prove my point. Then that doesn't make God true. I have to have a Bible that I can trust. And what's wonderful about this Bible is that we have in our hands, King James Bible, what's wonderful about it is, is that it keeps the context true. All the other Bibles muddle and mess up the context of what's said. And they do it through subtlety sometimes. And one of those things is we're, we're going to look at in this verse right here. In Galatians 2, verse 16, he says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. We know that. It's been concluded, right? He says, but by the faith of who? Jesus Christ. Every other Bible will take that word of and turn it into the word in. Now, what that does is, to the context is, is it's no longer going to deal with the faith of Jesus Christ. It's going to now deal with my faith in Jesus Christ. And when it, if it's going to be my faith in Jesus Christ, well, I don't know. Two days from now, maybe my faith in Jesus Christ isn't as strong as it is today. The issue there is, is that at the moment of salvation, we decide, I'm going to take my faith. I'm going to trust and believe in the finished work of what the Lord Jesus Christ did. And my faith rests in his faithfulness. And that's what justifies us, by the way. And he says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. You see that? Have we believed in him? Yes. But what justifies us? His faithfulness. That we might be justified, there it is right there, right? By the what? Faith of Christ. And not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Verse 20, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, notice how he lives, I live by the what? The faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He doesn't say I live by the faith in the Son of God. How is he going to live? By the faith of of the Son of God. By His faithfulness, that's how He's going to do it. You see that? It's not by our faith in it, because our faith is up and down, up and down, up and down. It's by His faithfulness. What justifies the believer? His faithfulness. Why? Because He was the one that was faithful to take the death of the cross. That's why. None of us were faithful to do that. We're the ones that were standing there wanting Him to be crucified. He did that he remained faithful so that we could say, I believe that, I trust that. And you know what God does? He takes it from there. Seals us with the Holy Spirit of promise into the day of redemption. He's going to glorify us. He's redeemed us. He's forgiven us in that moment. And then he remains faithful. We have to understand who we are in Christ. The issue is we've got to understand who Christ is, but we also need to rely on his faithfulness. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're in 1 Thessalonians 5. We're talking. What does this have to do with quench not the Spirit? We're going to see. In order to not quench the Spirit, we have to understand how the Spirit works. We have to understand how God's faith works. We have to understand how our faith works. And, and look at verse 24. It's kind of the conclusion of all the things that's mentioned there. He says in verse 24, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24, Faithful is he that what? Who's the one that calls us? Who's the one that calls us? 
It's God that does, right? And then notice what it says. Who also will what? Do it. So how does God going to work? He's the one that called us, but then he's going to also be the one that does the work. That's what that verse tells me. He's the one that's faithful. He's the one that's going to do the work. You know what our defense is in this life, by the way? You know, it talks about the shield of faith. The shield is what? It's a defense. And what the shield of faith does is, it's our defense. And how do we defend ourselves is, is we have to hold fast to God's word. Because if we don't hold fast to God's word, if we walk away, we walk away from the faith. You know what we do? We take the word of God. It talks about the nation of Israel took the word of God and they did what? They set it behind them. If I have a shield and I'm getting ready to go into battle and I say, you know what? This nice shield that can protect me, I'm going to leave it at home. How well defended am I now? That's why it's important for us to get into God's word. Because if we don't get into it, we don't know who we are. We don't know how to defend. We put down our shields. And by the way, when we put down our shields, when we put down the word of God, we quench the spirit. That's what quenches the spirit. Because how do we feed our souls? How do we feed our spirit? The only way we can do it is, is by getting into God's word. How does God speak today? Through his word. If I'm not in his word, how is he speaking to me? We have to get into the book. We have to trust it. We have to believe it. We have to have faith in it. We have to believe it's true. We have to have a Bible that we can trust. Does that make sense? We need to hold fast to it. Look at this, uh, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1. And look at verse 18. He's writing, he says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. And notice the instruction of verse 19. What does he say? Holding what? Faith. In a good conscience. Which some, having put where? Away. So some had it. What do they do? Put it away. Concerning the faith have made shipwreck. What do we see take place today, by the way? There's people that claim they have the faith, that they have the Word of God, that they trust it, but then what do they do with people's faith? They make it shipwreck. They say, oh, you have to go back, and now you need to obey the things of the law. Man's not justified by the works of the law. Oh, well, you need to go out and you need to do good today and you need to not sin. Well, how am I going to do that? We have to hold what? Faith. Holding faith. I like how it doesn't say hold faith. It says do what? Holding faith. It's active. It's something, by the way, we never stop doing. That's why it's worded. It doesn't just say hold it for a moment. Holding faith. That's what the believer does is holding faith. That's part of who we are. The key to not quenching the Spirit is, is to understand how God works today. And one of the most important things to think about is, is that the Word of God and the living God are equal. His Word is equal to who He is. Go to John chapter 1. You guys know the verses here. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I have to say that the book of John is um, such a special book to just go through and read and study and get to see who Christ is as he was in the flesh. And it's, and it's always been an amazing thing when you read through it of seeing that the true, I guess, display of a, someone that's completely full of the Spirit is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he talks to mankind and he's in discussions... It always comes back to things that are spiritual. And that's kind of a challenge to myself is, is a lot of my conversations don't end up that way, but every conversation he has is ends up spiritual. But look what it says about who Christ is. It says, in the beginning was the what? The Word. It's interesting it uses that term, the Word. We're going to see why. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word 
was who? The conclusion then is, is the Lord Jesus Christ is God. And it says, The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made. That was what? That was made. Verse 14, And the Word was made what? Flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is God. He is the display of God. He is the one that if we want to have access to God the Father, we have to go through Him. The nation of Israel, if they want to have access to the Father, who do they have to go through? They are going to have to go through Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Why? Because He paid the ultimate penalty of sin for them and for us. Now go to Psalms. Go with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 138. Psalms 138, and look at verse 1 and 2. He says, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for what? Thy truth. And then he says, for thou hast magnified thy word above what? All thy name. God is magnified what above his name? The word. Is the living God and his word equal? So then, as the living God, having his word equal with him, does he have the capability then to preserve his word for generations to come? He sure does. Do we have a Bible in our hands today that we can trust? Yes. Is there other people in the world, in other languages, that has a Bible they can trust? They do. Isn't that a wonderful thing that God has provided, by the way? He's provided his word. Why? Because the way we get to know who he is, is through what? His word. And is his word equal to who he is? It sure is. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. How does the Spirit of God work today? Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians 3 are two really important passages to see how it works today. And something to take note of and think of is, is that as we're, going, we're looking at Ephesians 5, the book of Ephesians, does it talk about the issue of speaking in tongues? No. Why? Because 1 Corinthians has already discussed that the issue of the speaking of tongues, the prophesying, what's going to happen to it? It's going to go away. It's going to cease. What's going to abide for the believer today? Faith, hope, charity. Right? Those are the three that abide today. The Spirit of God. Look at this passage. We're going to Ephesians 5, but look at Ephesians chapter 4. Does the Spirit of God already indwell us as believers? Yes. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of who? God, whereby ye are sealed unto when? The day of redemption. Do we have the Spirit of God in us? Has the Spirit of God sealed us unto the day of redemption? Can we grieve that Spirit that's in us? Can we quench that Spirit that's in us? But does that Spirit ever leave us? No. Because our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Right? We'll look at those verses later. But Ephesians chapter 5, and look at verse 18. Ephesians 5, verse 18. It says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is what? Access. What's the issue going on there? What does wine cause if you're drunk with it? Not to be sober, not to think clearly. Right? But be filled with what? The Spirit. What should the believer be filled with today? Spirit. Doesn't that verse it tell us to ask to be filled with the Spirit? Is it just an instruction of what we should do? It says be filled with what? The Spirit. What's the result of being filled with the Spirit? Look at the next verse. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, where? To 
to the Lord. What was the result in the book of Psalms when he trusted in the word with all his heart? It produced what? A song. Then he says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the result then of being filled with the Spirit is we speak to ourselves in Psalms, we have a song within our heart, and we have the ability to give thanks. And then he says in verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another, how? In the fear of God. To submit ourselves one to another is what? We're to serve one another. We are going to place others before ourselves, right? And then he says, so then you see, you see the action there, and then he says in verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as what? Unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let their wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as how? The Lord, the church. The reflection then of a spirit-filled believer is, is that it's going to reflect Christ with everyone, and it's going to reflect Christ where? In marriage, as a husband and as a wife. And then he says, verse 30, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and what? Of his bones. Who is? Which, by the way, what's he talking about? Us, the body of Christ, become one with him. Right? Then he says in verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. Notice what he says, though, but... I speak concerning Christ and the what? Church. Something important to note of. He's not describing the body of Christ as the bride of Christ. He's describing the body of Christ as us becoming one with him. Because his bride is yet to come, by the way, at the end of tribulation. He's describing here of our relationship that we become one with Christ. He's the head of us and we're members one of another, right? And then he says, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from where? The heart. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free, and ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, Neither is there a respect of persons where? With him. The reflection of someone being filled with the Spirit will reflect all the things that followed it here. What does it look like? It doesn't look like a bunch of people running around mindlessly. It looks like people that think soberly, think clearly, are able to function in their family lives and able to function in the workforce. It looks like some, this is what a Spirit-filled believer should look like. That's the result too, by the way. A good marriage a good family, good in the workplace. The life of Christ is reflected in all aspects, everywhere. It's not just reflected here at church on Sunday. That's what a spirit-filled believer looks like. It doesn't look like someone that's rolling around on the floor going crazy. It looks like someone that has stability, someone that has a, a controlled thinking process, Someone that has the ability to go into situations that are tough and bring a peace to those situations. That's what someone with, filled with the Spirit looks like. And what's amazing is you go to Colossians chapter 3, go to Colossians chapter 3, I look at Ephesians 5 as more of the issue of the roles of 
what does the roles look like and what's the responsibility of the roles? Colossians 3 is going to be more of what is the response to those roles. But what we see is, is a, it's very, very similar language in both passages. And so in Colossians chapter 3, look at verse 16. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, how? In all wisdom. Now, it doesn't say be filled with the Spirit there, does it? But what is the result of the point when we say, I'm going to allow God's Word to dwell in me, and I'm going to have wisdom with it? What does it look like then in my life? Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts, where? To the Lord. Is that the same response of someone that's being filled with the Spirit? It's the exact same response. So the conclusion we have to come to then is, is that the result of the word of Christ dwelling richly in all wisdom is the same as being filled with the Spirit. So how do we get filled with the Spirit today? We have to pick up the word of God. We have to study it. We have to read it. We have to meditate on it. And guess what? That's how we're filled with the Spirit. It's not by an emotional experience. It's by us putting in the work. You know, anything in life, when you think about it, anything in life... Jordan's learning to play, I'm going to call Jordan out, Jordan's learning to play guitar, all right? He's learning to play guitar with all his free time he's going to have starting his new job, right? All right, he's, he's learning to play guitar. It takes time. He, did, he didn't just pick it up and say, you know what, I'm going to be good at playing guitar today and picked it up and wow, man, I've never heard anybody play guitar better than Jordan, right? He's going to have to put the time and the work into it. The same thing goes if we, want to, if we want to have Christ's life living in and through us, we have to put work into it. And the work we have to put into it is, is we have to pick up our Bibles, read them, study them, believe them, trust them. That's the work we have to do. It doesn't just come and poof one day, oh man, I know my Bible so well. We all have to get into it. Personal Bible study time. You know, we stress that so much here. Personal Bible study time. Not just sitting here listening to us ramble on and on and on, but getting in and spending quality time one-on-one -on -one with God's Word. That's where the best growth comes from, by the way. And that's where the joy comes in is that you sit down, we sit down, when we, we sit down and we read something in God's Word that sticks out to us and, it, and, and we look at it, we believe it, we trust it, and we can see it in our lives what joy that brings. The result of that, how does it get there though? We have to let the word of Christ dwell in us. How do we let the word of Christ dwell in us? We have to get into it. Does that make sense? And the reflection and the response of that is, is exactly the same thing. What's the next thing? Verse 18, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. 19, husbands, love your wives. 20, children. 21, fathers. 22, servants. You see that? The same thing follows when the word of Christ is dwelling in us richly is what he said to be filled with the Spirit. So how do we quench the Spirit? By doing all the things contrary to this. Quench not the Spirit. Well, how? How do I quench the Spirit? Well, I quench the Spirit first off. The easiest way to do that is, is by not picking this up. That's how I quench it. There's a passage I'm just thinking about in 2 Timothy. Go with me to 2 Timothy. Chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And look at verse 6. 2 Timothy 1 verse 6. Paul writes, he's writing to Timothy and he says, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou, what? Stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. The question I have to ask then is, do we have the gift of God in us? We all have the gift of God in us. And sometimes does that gift, the, the, the word of God, does sometimes it go dormant in us? Sure it can. You know, I work in the, the wonderful world of mold remediation, right? And so how does mold work? Mold works, it has to have a food source to be able to grow, be able to live. You take away the food source, mold doesn't truly die. People think that it dies behind the walls and stuff like that. You take away the food source, it goes dormant. It's still there. 
And when, when that source comes back, well, through the moisture, whatever it may be, and it hits it, you know what it does? It reinvigorates and it's alive and then it begins to spread. I hate comparing the Word of God to that, but you think about it, God's Word is in us, but then if I don't do anything with it, guess what it does? If I don't supply and I don't feed my spirit in me, guess what it does? It goes dormant. There's no life. But then when I pick up His Word and I excite it, you know what it does? And you stir it up. It begins to work in our lives. You know, God gave us His creation, I think, to use as examples, okay? You guys are looking at me, right? You're just thinking about, do I have mold in my house now? It's like when you talk about, do I have lice, your head itches, except for Jay, right? (laughs) But you think about it, we have to stir up the gift of God. How do we do it? We have to have personal one-on-one time with his word. How does he work? Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We talked about this verse ages ago in 1 Thessalonians, I'm sure by now, right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And verse 13, he says, For this cause also thank we God, how often? Without ceasing. Similar language of what he's using in chapter 5. Giving thanks in everything, pray without ceasing, rejoice evermore. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when he received, what? The word of God, which he heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which, what, effectually worketh also in you that, what, believe. So when we take this, when we take God's word, we read God's word, we study God's word, and we trust it to be true, we believe it to be true, we, will he work in us? The promise of that verse is, is that when I believe his word, I trust his word, the Spirit of God that's in me, is He going to work in and through me then? But I have to let His Word dwell in me. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Not just dwell in us richly, but in what? All wisdom. You know, I think it's important to think about that part in that verse. Let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. It's good to think about that. But how does it dwell in us? In all wisdom. And so when we get to chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, we see where it says here, In verse 19, quench not the what? Spirit. Well, how do we not quench the Spirit? We have to be filled with the Spirit. We have to let the Word of Christ dwell on us richly in all wisdom. That's the simple answer to that verse. Because if we do the things that God outlines of, we take His Word in, we're filled with the Spirit, we let the Word of Christ dwell on us richly in all wisdom, you know what naturally happens when we believe and trust His Word? It will work in us. He will do the work in us. But if we put his word behind us, guess what that does? It quenches the spirit. So how do I not quench the spirit? Simple answer is, get into God's word. Believe God's word. Trust his word. Believe verse 24, by the way. Verse 24, faithful is he that calleth you, who also will what? Do it. Philippians 2 says, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Believe it. Trust it. It's God that does the work. Amen? Let's give thanks. Father, thank you for us being able to be here this morning, be able to have a a time of fellowship together, and to be able to just come and openly talk about your word and see how that you work today in and through your word. Thank you for giving us your perfect, preserved word that we can come to and trust. And thank you for the life that we have now in the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, as we Go through our week. May we think about and meditate on your word. May we pray without ceasing. May we rejoice. May we give thanks. And may we quench not the spirit. Thank you for the life we now have, that we can go out and share your perfect word with others, and the love that we have from the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can share that love with others as well. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.